just, so, just have like a black about. screen. DDM Network presents. Da, 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 and just have us talking on the background, saying some fucked up shit like we were just talking about. Ooh. Nah, it's Corey's trying really marketing over here, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, <laughs> Chris Forsberg is getting kind of old. <laughs> Just so you know, you gonna have to start finding somebody to replace that void when the time comes. Man, this is already a disaster. Yeah. Welcome to the DDM podcast, and we're gonna talk about drift stuff, but hopefully in a productive manner to help people. So I'm here with Jelani Winston and Corey Misco. Misco, yes. Musco. No. <laughs> Maestro. Uh, first segment is called Tech Tips, and we'll be doing these throughout uh, the year, talking about different elements of drifting. So this one, this week, is pretty basic. It's going to be basic drift chassis, and what you wanna, what would be a good chassis to get started in. The first question I got for you guys is, you guys started in the early 2000s drifting, or mid-2000s. Mid. Yeah, mid, about mid. Mid-2000s. So... Going back to when you first started drifting, you guys didn't have a lot of money, obviously. What chassis are you choosing back then? Uh, it's probably going to be an 80s or 90s car. Yeah. What What are you guys driving back then? I went with the S14, but the thing about it was it was also my daily driver. It was my only car, and there wasn't that many events around, so learning how to drift usually took place on the street. So I wasn't showing up with a truck and trailer or nothing like that. We were just hitting the spot for a little bit and getting out. Um, but I, I went with the S14, and uh, it, it honestly worked great. You know, I, you I, I don't would, really you would it. change it? Uh, no, I wouldn't have changed it for back then at the price the S14 I got was. It was four grand. It was a Tennessee car. It came on Cusco suspension and had a bunch of stuff done to it already. Um, was on wheels and all that stuff, but and that, and now I think a car equivalent to that would be about twenty five hundred dollars more. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, no, I don't regret it. The car was excellent, man. I, you know, I drove it far and all over the place, and it never let me down. What so. about you, Corey? <clears throat> yeah, when I got into drifting um, for my first car, I really wanted an S chassis. So uh, we shopped around, and I finally came across the S thirteen that was for sale down the street. Um, it was $500, blown motor or whatever. So I, I bought it, saved up a year, had a KA put in it by a shop called XAT Racing in Tampa, Florida. Had an S14 KA, swapped into it, and paid like $2,500 to put a KA in this Ooh. thing. So, <laughs> Big and large. Yeah, at, if I would have known what I know now, I could have had a, a SR swap in it at that time. They weren't very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but from then on, I had the car for maybe another year or so, drove it stock, had a welded diff, stock suspension. Mm -hmm. And then I found this S12, had a roll cage in it, uh, charge speed, bucket seat, Cusco coilovers, mm -hmm. Fujitsu bow exhaust. It was pretty cool looking, had diamond racing steelies. Mm -hmm. And the kid wanted straight up, uh, trade straight up, plus 500 cash in my end. So at the time I was like, yo, this seems like a pretty good deal. You know, I got this drift-ready chassis. don't really need to do too much to it. And mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I was getting the end of my high school uh, senior year, and yeah. the car wasn't really daily drivable that well. It had some issues, and I was about to move up north and definitely wasn't going to be a winter vehicle. So I ended up trading it, got an E30, and slowly started building that up over the years. And that's really... The BMW chassis is really what I grew into. Gotcha. All right, so there's a couple other uh, 90s chassis that you guys haven't really talked about at all. FCR X7, you got uh, an older Supra, uh, AE86, so you got a couple other yeah. uh, older chassis. Uh, you guys want to go in just real quick, I mean, start naming a couple positive negatives about them. Yeah, yeah I think low-key FC is probably one of the best-looking cars to me. Uh, I love the way FCs look, especially when they're done up. It's a timeless look to them. Um, also, I like rotary engines, so I think that's pretty cool. Sound amazing. Um, you just probably should know what you're doing. You just got to know what you're doing. You got to be a purist. You got to do your research, do your homework. You can't just jump into that car and expect to have a lot of success. But, man, like, the impact from it. Hear one idling. Hear one on track. Can't help but perk up. What kind, what kind of cams are in that thing? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you hear that a lot back in the day, especially. Uh, but, yeah, I, I've always loved seeing and hearing a rotary chassis on track, like, does things. Um, 
So definitely always gravitated towards the FC and the FD, which is a completely different aspect of price range and affordability and obtainability for some people. But uh, yeah, I like FCs. Um, I will say the Mark III Super has been growing on me lately. The more and more I see people start to use them. Uh, I was not that much of a fan of that car for a long time, but slowly but surely I've been coming around on that. Um, Z32s even hated those for a long time. <laughs> those, yeah. those two chassis back in high school, when someone was like, oh, I want to be different, get a Mark III Super or Z32, mm -hmm. where I was like, nah, get away from, <laughs> get that, away thing. from that, that thing. That thing yeah. won't drift if we talk about people out of them. Yep. Yeah, and I, I got respect for those now. 300ZX has grown on me. Uh, I was out in Oregon not so long ago, and the guy had one with a VQ swapped it, and I was like, that's genius. <laughs> VQ and a 300ZX? Oh, wow, that's money. Like, And it worked really good, so that was pretty cool. Opened my eyes up. Uh, even Z31, same thing. I'm starting to gravitate towards those. They, they're starting to appeal to me. I've seen some done up real nice popping up lately. Mm -hmm. um, as far as some of the pros and cons, in my eyes, obviously the rotary has a couple with it being a rotary, there's some yeah. liability issues and concerns, if not taken care of by somebody who knows what they're doing, or at least to have a circle around you. Maybe, you know, if you get in the rotaries and there's already a couple guys around you who got them down and got them figured out, you can kind of learn off of them. Awesome. Definitely do that. Um, and then uh, availability of parts, you know, not as wide as some of the other chassis, but it's out there. So um, that's cool. Uh, Hachi, same thing. Finding a GTS Corolla. Could be a little tricky, could be a little pricey. Um, you, you could start with an SR5, but like after a while you'll just end up wanting to convert it to a GTS and that requires you to like change everything on that car. Um, so there's that. And then, I mean, even S chassis have some, some flaws, like finding one without rust if you don't, if you, if you live in the rust belt, it's like, how? Like, mm -hmm. it's hard to do. Uh, yeah. Oh, SC300 was another one. I have one of those, duh. Uh, yeah. I think that's a forgotten, very good chassis, a lot of potential. The 2J in it this can actually be used Yeah, that's a newer chassis, though, isn't it? Nah, 92. It came back all the 92. 92. Mine's a 92. Old. See? And that's the cool thing about that, that car is the interior on it. Yeah, once again, the interior guy. The yeah. interior on it is nice, even though it likes to rip itself apart Falling over apart. time. <laughs> <laughs> now, the interior is nice. You see it, and you get around it. You're like, this is 92, bro? It's got projector headlights, one touch. Bose ten speaker subwoofer like what like ninety two and you can get those for cheap like all day and the, the two J's are healthy in them like you know it's hard to find a five speed one but mine's actually original five speed one so uh, yeah 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 that, they're good they they have some flaws too they're really heavy um, and then naturally since it's being a close relative with a Supra you get that tax with it you know super tax so you gotta worry about that but it's not too bad they don't take too much to make those cars do really well. Um, there's a couple other 90s cars too that, that kind of get lost the Cressida yeah. One, Cre yeah one of my favorites I think is still the S12 yeah yeah I would definitely like those more over there's a shorter wheelbase car though it's a little... uh, pretty close to the S chassis yeah, actually it is, yeah. yeah yeah Yep. It just the only one I've ever seen just looks short to me. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, they, they, yeah, they look short. They but. look like Hachis. Like a lot of people. I remember my boy David on the East Coast. He he had his parked out of the drift event. He always had his huge sign on it. It's not, not a Hachi. A Hachi. <laughs> <laughs> Stop walking up and ask me about my Hachi. It's not a Hachi. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So I guess they they kind of ooze that short wheelbase vibe because of the resemblance to the Hachi. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, problem with some of those older cars though now is like yeah you're paying a premium to get them. Because, you know, people were gravitating towards them for so long, you know, supply and demand. You start gravitating towards it, people start raising the price. So now you're paying a premium to get something that needs work. Yeah. You know, you're going to get it with worn out bushings, tire ball <laughs> joints, beat tie rods, alternators, and power steering pumps that all need to be gone through and replaced. Yeah. And, you know, after a while, you can nickel and dime yourself pretty hard when you can step into something newer. You know, a lot of these cars... You get this feeling like sometimes you see some of these BMWs rolling around and these 350Zs and G35s and things like that. You don't realize like, oh crap, that thing came out in 03. It's 2019. Right. That thing is old and mm -hmm. cheap. And cheap. And they got they all got 200,000 miles on them now. Mm -hmm. You know. So uh, you can get step into some of these chassis the other day. Somebody was talking to me about, oh man, it'd be cool to get an E90, and I'm like, why not? And they're like. Oh man, it's gonna be crazy expensive. I'm like, dude, they're like sixty five hundred bucks. I'm like, really? Oh, actually, you no, know, it was you. <laughs> it was Nate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's actually been sending me them. Yeah, you've been sending them to me. Yeah, yeah. they were they're affordable. And you're like, what? This car feels so new though. 
Yeah. Like, yeah, that's because we're too broke to afford new cars. So everything <laughs> feels new to you because so you drive true. old buckets. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's pretty, you don't think about it, but it's like, man, you could start out drifting your first car. It's plausible to be an E90 for the same price as getting some of these cleaner, mm-hmm. I mean, some of these uh, older cars that need work after you factor in that putting the work into them you know and it, it, it's it's not just like the japanese stuff either i mean no. even even like the american stuff like an old fox body mm-hmm. i mean the the drag racing scene is ridiculous right now and finding a clean fox body it's not easy yeah and they're not cheap if it is clean you know exactly so, so and i've seen people drift those and those seem to do pretty well too but i mean it's like finding an older chassis is extremely difficult and uh, at least from what I've seen, and then also all the modifications you have to do just to make it, I guess, I mean, easy to drift or or, or just make it easier on yourself and, uh, and not feel uh, real loose or exactly. falling apart on you. Exactly. It, like literally, <clears throat> when, when we're trying to buy these older chassis, like when we helped Neville get his car, you know, we drove five, six hours south of here to, to Kentucky just to get out of the Rust Belt where you didn't, where we weren't paying that premium tax to get a car that wasn't you know falling mm-hmm. apart and you know uh holes all in it and stuff so uh yeah we had to we had to track pretty far to just so you mean you factor in the cost of uh, making that drive maybe cop in a hotel room add that into the cost of the car too if you really want to or, or shipping it you know we just shipped the car from seattle not too long ago so uh it's a thousand dollars yeah you know so yeah i mean you think about that stuff especially if you're living in these areas that get that's heavy snow heavy salt mm-hmm. you know stuff like that so yeah, it's definitely a lot easier to step into a newer chassis than it was when I got started drifting, you know. And uh, yes, yeah, so, so so that kind of brings me to the next question: is okay if you started drifting today, um, had a pretty low budget still, you know, you're new, want to get into drifting, so you got a budget of like 4K, you know, you saved up some money. What are you buying? Uh, that's the dog in the background. If anyone's wondering. <laughs> <laughs> Tyson's getting a little restless. Uh, so, if I was starting over today, what am I buying? You know, there's a lot of different cars you can go with. Uh, me being a Nissan guy, uh, my heart wants to gravitate towards the Japanese car and the Japanese culture still, because that's where I found my happy place when I got into this. Um, but, you know, Bavaria Motor Works is calling. I'm probably gonna go with an E46. You know, uh, it's it's relatively light as far as a new newer chassis goes, for especially yeah. for how much crap it has in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and just after being around them recently, messing around with this nerd's car and stuff like that, uh, there's so much mechanical grip in that car already. Like you don't have to buy a lot of parts. You know, like with the 240, you pretty much spend all of your money taking everything that about it that made it a 240 from the factory, and. Uh, taking it off the car and putting some re-engineered geometry or some uh, uh, new design on it to make it better. Yeah. You know, so like, oh man, we got these control arms to do this and change, you know, we got roll center correction, you got this, that, 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 that. And it ends up costing you so much money. Like, you know, um, easily if you set the rear subframe of a done up 240 on jack stands and you counted out how much money was in that rear subframe, it's gonna be 3,500 to $4,000 depending on what you have on it. Yeah. I mean. So just in the rear subframe, diff axles and everything, and at that point you've got adapter stubs to put better axles in it. Yeah. You've got th- this, this, mm-hmm. that, and a third, maybe a 350Z diff, maybe a Skyline diff, and it's so much money. E46, like you could go into FD with stock trailing arms and a lot of basic suspension upgrades that literally cost nothing. You know, uh, his, lower, his lower control arms were made by him, and you could recreate those for couple hundred dollars and have spares yeah, you know yeah, i think i made six of them for like 200 bucks right <clears throat> and yeah. they're just straight links and even the upper one is, is pretty close to the same thing mm-hmm. so uh and then you don't have to change out a lot of stuff yeah uh, even on the front suspension when you get the angle kit on the e46 it still incorporates the OEM front knuckle. It's just a bracket that bolts to the bottom, and then you can choose to get a tubular lower control arm, or you can just run an E36 one that's lengthened. Mm-hmm. And it saves you so much money doing it that way. So you can have a fully, like, addressed suspension on the car for 2,500 bucks, coilovers included. Yeah. You know, and just do some bushings, reinforce the mm-hmm. subframe mount, and of course, so it, even in like pro am, 
Pro 2, uh, and grassroots level, like the car doesn't have to change. Mm -hmm. It's an affordable chassis to do. And then you can start the, the fact that it comes with the inline six. Yeah. It comes with a decent amount of power and torque. You can start out with it at that power level, especially if you're getting a 28 or a 330 or something that makes a little bit more mm -hmm. uh, power and be consistent and happy with that and keep up with some of these other cars that have SR20 swaps and 1J yeah. swaps and literally drive door to door with them with a car that still has AC. Yeah. So um, very interesting chassis. The one thing I'll say about it though is, you know, my heart's with style, obviously. And, you know, I will hope to see more body kits and more uh, styling options popping up for them. So I think that's really what holds it back from being a feasible chassis. We go back to what I said earlier, that inedible quest to be different. <clears throat> And it seems like with an E46, it's like, what M3 fascia do you want? <laughs> or M Tech bumper. Or M Tech bumper or ZHP bumper. Like, you know, you got like one of three things you could do to that car mm -hmm. that keeps it, that, that to style it. And then after a while, you're just in a sea of them that all look the same. All right. Like, so say, say if you wanted to start today, but you kind of wanted to be more stylish and different. What, what, are you, what are you picking? Ooh. Mm, that's a tough one. Let me tell you what's been growing on me that I think is the absolute worst choice ever because of the engine off the rip. The worst choice? Yeah. RX-8. Ooh. The engine is trash, yeah. in my opinion. It's a sexy car, though. Sexy car. Yeah. And then more and more I've been seeing people styling these things up. Man. Man, man, man. That is, that is you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm rocking with an RX-8. Um, I feel like if I got one with an already hurt motor, I could maybe, you know, the average guy is not going to be able to do what I can do because of the tools I have available to me. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, th throw something else in there, SR, yeah. and shoot. I mean, you got a lot of, I put a beans engine in it. I don't care. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like, but mm -hmm. or, or put a 13B back in it, you know, or FC engine. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I like the RX-8. I think styling-wise, man, that's a very attractive car. And it's different. You don't see a lot of them at the track. Exactly. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with the motor. Yep. All right, so that brings me to Corey. You got a chassis to start with. You were kind of cheating. You already have an E46. Yeah. But, but uh, are, you, are you picking the E46 still? Yeah, I'm going to go with the E46 just because you can you can get them pretty cheap, and most of the time they need very little work. Gotcha. They got a couple things you need to address. All right, so you've you've done some very different things with your E46, though, stylish-wise. Yeah, I can't take full credit for the stylish part because mm -hmm. that's how I bought the car originally. Okay. But I've redone it since then, you know, a few different times and mm -hmm. improved it and kind of, you know, made my own style out gotcha. of it. Gotcha. Nice. So if you couldn't choose that chassis but wanted something to be really cool and stylish, what are you picking? Probably an E36. It's super close to the E46, mm -hmm. but still pretty affordable. Yeah. Um, you know, you can get an M3 for around four grand or less. And yeah. They're making pretty good power, probably like somewhere to like stock SR. Not a BMW. Let's make it interesting. Pick something other than a BMW. Pick something other than a BMW. Lame person. Okay, I, I got a real question for you guys. Why has no one said 350Z? I don't like the style of them. They look like fish. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone who has a 350Z. I still love you. But. Yeah. Honestly, I'd rather have a G37 coupe. Facts. Okay. Or but sedan. That's, mm, I like the coupes better. I'll take that. But I think those are still a little bit out of that 4K price range. No. Mm. You can get them. Yeah. You, can you know? Yeah. Not, not Especially great, the sedans. Not, not in like great, great condition, yeah. but yeah. You, can, you can find them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I guess you're starting to get a little bit more expensive with that chassis. But I mean... Great chassis, I would think, to start with at least. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's all. I, that's what I've seen a lot of people rave about is the the 350Zs and and the the Nissan of that chassis. Yeah. Mean, whether it's I mean, an Infiniti or a 350Z version. They're but. they're great performing cars and they definitely mm -hmm. work really well. Mm -hmm. Personally, I just don't like the style of them. Okay. Yeah, I do like the Z though. Z's Z's are cool. I think it's an excellent car to start with. I kind of put it in the same boat as the E46 in the sense of styling. Like there's only maybe like four or five things you can do to them to really make them gotcha. look good and then yeah. there's not that much yeah, you, can buy that, you can buy that spirit ray kit which is like five grand oh, i forgot about that <laughs> <laughs> okay there might be six things you can do to make them look good um, um, yeah but okay so all right so there's a couple other newer chassis that we haven't hit yet um that i just curious quick thoughts on is 300 um good car yeah i like the is i think it's a really good car I, i've been seeing them steadily around five and you can get them cheaper than that, but 
five seems to be the magic number to get a pretty decent one. So yeah. that puts it in that four grand, I guess you could say. Close. Pretty close to it. I've seen, I've seen a couple recently for like 3500 Oh, yeah. I mean, our buddy just sold one for 3500 That actually had steering angle mods mm-hmm. and Fortune Auto coilovers and wheels on it already. Yep. So, yeah. Um, yeah, like you could definitely get into an IS four-door two, load stuff in it, take it to the track. They make a lot of style. Not, not a lot. I guess that's only three or four things they make. Styling wise, yeah, for those too. things are definitely pretty limited. Yeah, there's some new stuff coming out for them. Uh, I was at Serial Nine. How yeah. is uh, like mods for them though? Is there is there a is there a market for that? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, because Toyota's sedan chassis usually carry over a lot of the same parts between multiple models, so okay. that kind of makes it easy to share parts between different different types. If I was starting and was going to be different, I would be picking the Mustang, a new age new edge Mustang. Uh, just for, um, I've seen people do really well with them with very simple mods done to them. And, I mean, for the most part, if you keep the motor stock, it's pretty reliable as well. So, mm-hmm. um, again, you know, styling-wise, there's not a whole lot out for them. Um, uh, I agree to disagree on that, actually, because, I mean, you got all these different Roush kits you can get, Celine kits, you know, yeah. stuff like that. There's a lot of companies making replicas of those now. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of those Celine kits look pretty mean. They kind of got, like, this bell side JDM flair to them, you know. <laughs> yeah. So if you really wanted to, you can make a pretty cool-looking Mustang. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a cool option to have because not everybody gravitates towards the JDM hot boy, fanboy stuff, and mm-hmm. they might want some America, you know, yeah. and, you know, flex the flex that American flag, show the mm-hmm. guns a little bit. Uh, and they're decently nimble. Uh, mm-hmm. I see them out there. They look, they do pretty well. So that's definitely a, a cool. Ch- Yo, actually, uh, what was it? Justin back in Texas had the like, like JDM oh, yeah. Hot Boy Mustang. Yeah, at, I think no, it's pretty fire. Bright seats, Nardi Will on MB yeah. Battles. Like it was the most JDM uh, D Max floor mats in it and stuff. Probably the most JDM Mustang to ever exist since Yakoi drove it. Yakoi drove it. That makes it extra <laughs> JDM. Actually, I forgot about that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I, I think that's a, a chassis that I think could definitely be put in that category of like something that people should look for. Um, yeah, and people shouldn't sleep on V6 Mustangs either because those no. things rip. V6 mm-hmm. Mustangs do put in work. Proven. Yeah. So, uh, are we missing any like basic chassis that I mean people should be looking out for that you know? Camaros. They're starting to pop up. Yeah. The flex they're so, body. They're so big though. They, they look like st- big bodies are cool though. They look like yeah. catfish. They're in style. <laughs> <laughs> got Z, the 350Z looks like a fish, and so does the Camaro. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I just I haven't I've seen one do well. It was Collins yeah. at a, a Super D. Yep, yeah. that yeah. car's actually fairly basic too. Is it? Yeah. Okay, because that that thing that was the first time I've actually seen one like rip. Yeah. So um, back uh, pre 2010, there was Zach Caitlin and the IROC Z2 as well. Yeah, I think he used to dope. travel around and compete pretty hefty in that thing, and it was pretty basic as well. I heard. I yeah. thought you had to change a lot in those stuff. Uh, he he did do a decent wise. amount of work, but it, it was like a NASA car before he turned yeah. it into a drift car. So it had some suspension upgrades and rear upgrades, but yeah. nothing too crazy. Gotcha. Well, and, and the the Mustang. big thing about it is, um, you know, when I got started in drifting, uh, or actually when we all got started in drifting, like you know, we weren't thinking about trucks and trailers and towing to and from That's the track true. Yeah. and stuff like that. And with a lot of these newer cars, you kind of have that restored confidence to drive your car to the track, you know. Uh, yeah. I used to drive my S14 from Ohio all the way back to D.C. Yeah. to go home for drift events and stuff like that. And occasionally we slot it around and I'd drive it eight hours back and, you know, I, I trusted it. Um, I don't know if you could do that ten years later from when I was doing that exactly. now with the same chassis. That's that's why you'd go with the newer chassis. That's why you go with the yeah. newer chassis. So you get an Infiniti <laughs> G35 sedan, you can legitimately throw your spare wheels and tires in the back, a cooler, a small tool bag, and a jack, and two jack stands, and go to the track and drive it there, drift it, and drive it home. You know, and having that uh, reliability yeah. kind of takes some of the overhead off of getting into the sport. Like, you don't feel like I have to go get a truck payment mm-hmm. or get a truck and get a trailer and have to maintain both of those, keep insurance on both of those, keep tires on both of those and things like that. You can just <coughs> jump in your car, drive it to the track and drive it back, you know. Um, it was only a couple months ago, you know, I don't know, I don't know shit, almost a year ago because you're going to Australia again. Damn. Yeah. Hey, maybe I'll drift your car again while you're in Australia. Um, but yeah. It's not ready, so no. Corey was gracious <laughs> enough to let me drift his car while he was, uh, uh, you know, abroad. And uh, I, I have a trailer, you know, I didn't put it on a trailer. I, threw some shit in the back of it and 
drove it an hour north and yeah. drifted it all day and After you drove blew it back. A, blew a bead on a tire. I did blow a bead off a tire. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I was trying to stretch hot boy life. But, yeah, so th- that cuts the overhead down so much, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's even that you don't have to have two cars at that point, even two maybe. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you take well enough care of it. It could be your daily driver, mm-hmm. and you can still slide it, you know. And it can be your, your main thing. It doesn't have to be this, like, oh, I only drive this, you know, on the weekends occasionally because it might break down on me. <laughs> you know, my, my rotor, my, my 1991 rotary might – yeah. Spit apex seals off the back at any given point in time. So, um, or my KA might eject itself, eject its rods, you know, through through the windshield. But yeah. so uh, that's something to think about. Like, you get a nice enough car, and you actually save yourself money in the long run. You know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that that's a big factor. Like, the first three years of me being in this, I was that was my car. That was yeah. it. S14. So. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a big point, I think, especially for people trying to get into it, is the drivability and being able to, you know, like you said, drive the track and then drive back because, I mean, not everyone has the eight, ten grand needed for a truck and trailer, mm-hmm. you know, and that's just a whole nother expense that... You get a nice enough car, you could even take your girlfriend on dates in it and not be ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> I drive a 91 RX-7. You want to go on a date? What's that smell? Oh, it's the oil injection. <laughs> <laughs> hey. All right. Um, so is there – There's a co- I got a couple other questions real quick uh, regarding chassis that I uh, kind of thought of. So if say, uh, say you're an American and mm. above, like, average size of a normal person, like you guys and – Everyone else, we know. calling me fat. <laughs> yes, Jelani, you're fat. Thank you. I was just making sure. <laughs> There's a lot of chassis that are difficult to fit in, um, especially for really tall people and stuff. Uh, what's a good chassis for a big guy to get into? 2500 HD. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you did post a video on 1320 of some guy drifting a 3500 dually coming. So, I mean, I guess yes. you can make it happen. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> GS300 is yeah. uh, a okay. chassis you could definitely fit large people in. Mm-hmm. SC300 as well. Um, LS400. LS400. Maybe even a Mark III Supra. Are those kind of big guy friendly? Man, I haven't sat in one in like 30 years. So I don't yeah, know. it's been a while since I sat in one. Yeah. Okay, so by like an LS300, SC300. Yeah. Honestly, like a lot of the Lexus and Toyotas. Uh, pretty big cars are pretty big even okay. the e46 Which, once again not to be yeah, beating that true. horse into the freaking ground yeah um, my seat okay. is sky high in my car and i'm still struggling to see over the dash so you can definitely really? slam those seats and dang all right so next question i got on here is what's a chassis that you don't see um that you think would be cool to see more of out RX8. there rx8 i agree mm-hmm. i mean obviously the big things the motor so i mean any rx8 that you probably see out there is going to be either a motor swap into it yeah like burns Some like burns Fire. i'd also like to see more supers yeah i mean yeah. that takes some more modification as well but i mean yeah, you've seen them uh that would be cool uh i personally would uh i i'm gonna i'm gonna go on a personal limb here and i'd like to see some more volvos out yeah. there i mean they're just they have their own personality and uh especially the old one the old rear wheel drive ones and yep. i have one and this something something cool about watching a grandma car <laughs> spitting smoke out the back oh, yeah. sideways like yep. you know there's just something different about that and i enjoy um y33 q45 yes okay those things are amazing yep i used to daily one of those and by daily, I mean street drifted. Um, <laughs> with no exhaust. With no exhaust. It sounded like Chris Forsberg's FD car with, it, with, no. six, with it, six cylinders misfiring. It did not. It sounded like uh, Chevy 1500 with open exhaust manifold. It sounded terrible. <laughs> How dare you disrespect my car. It was awful, and you know it. <laughs> it was. But I loved it. Uh, right. But yeah, I, I think those cars look great. Mm-hmm. Junction Produce makes some cool little accessories and stuff, and okay. a couple other people. Mm-hmm. Version Select and... Uh, it was pretty cool to see the uh, Fred Lump Lump one yeah. come out because then I was like, oh, someone did it. Yes. 
So. <laughs> and everyone thought it was a chaser. Mm. <laughs> yep. See, why are you paying 20 grand to import a chaser? The Q45 is already over here, baby. Just put the JZ in it. Yeah. Done. All right. So that leaves me actually to uh, my final question in this segment. Would you import a chassis to drift? If so, what chassis? Oh, my God. Yes, I would. Uh, me personally, I saw hate for this on Facebook the other day, so I'm going to address it. Four door R33. Trash. Amazing. <laughs> Trash. I'm importing one of those. It's import- my least favorite. Importing a fish. Like okay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> another one, if I had to choose. Mm. You're not going to stick with your all time favorite, Verosa? Yeah, I mean, Verosa, of course, but I'm trying not to be cliche because there's already one in front of the shop. So. Yeah, it's not yours, though. It's not mine, but it kind of killed the buzz for me. <laughs> buzz Killington. <laughs> Um, well, you could also steal it. I could steal it. I know where the key is. Uh, <laughs> shit. I lost my train of thought. I don't know. What, what would you import? What, would, what are you importing? Hmm. Don't say something dumb Euro car that no, that no one's ever heard of and no, I don't two hundred of. <laughs> Actually, uh, I would I would import an RS six if I could, ooh. but but you know. That requires money. Right. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think one... I'm going to have to go to the R34 Skyline. But you, you can get them at the uh, buy here, pay here. <laughs> like early 2000s Impala. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> yeah, you can also get you know the S15 Grand Prix. Yeah. As well. Grand Am <laughs> GT two-door. Get it thing. straight. Whatever. Same thing. <laughs> Uh, so the Mark II, that's what I was thinking of earlier. Not the Chaser, but the Mark II. Uh, JZX100, though. Those look real good. Uh, what's a, cra- a crazy thing to think about is, uh, you know, I had to put it in perspective for someone, but, you know, the when we went to go get the Verosa, you know, it, obviously it's not the cheapest investment to make when mm-hmm. you start getting into those cars. But, you know, someone messaged me and was like, man, are people really going and paying that much for drift cars and stuff like that? And I'm like, what do you mean? And it's like, oh, I mean, like, you know, that, that car's not that cheap. You know, it's 15, 16, whatever, yeah. you know, $1,000 average to get an imported car. Mm-hmm. You know, people are really spending 15 grand on drift cars. And I'm like, people are really spending 15 grand on quads, 20 grand mm-hmm. on side by sides. Like, you know, mm-hmm. uh, it's for the guys out there who really want to, like, it, it's not a bad idea. If you can get a car that already has some mods on it, maybe it came over on coilovers, adjustable mm-hmm. links, it's already got a swap, obviously. It's not even mm-hmm. a swap, it's got a factory motor in it that's mm-hmm. already making decent power and stuff like that, it's a feasible option to get that head start and not have to deal with all that stuff. Um, I mean, people would be like, no, man, start with low, ho- low horsepower, but, like, that's what they're starting with in Japan is a chaser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, they didn't start with a KAS-13 in Japan, yeah. <laughs> you know? So uh, it, it is a good option. I mean, and if your credit's straight and you can do it, you know, go cop that, mm-hmm. you know, loan and, and or – if you got cash, go buy it. I mean, people do it for quads all the time. They're like, oh, but you're going to go pay all that money. What if you wreck it? Uh, I mean, you know, my old roommate bought a brand-new K&M quad and tumbled that bitch right down the hill. So <laughs> it happens. It's happening. You know, snowmobiles, any other type of uh, extracurricular, you know, power sports vehicles you're buying. Like, you know, nobody looks at when you, somebody with a snowmobile like, man, you bought that? Like, uh, I do. Oh, uh, okay. Of course, a different level of broke. <laughs> so, yeah, like. Don't don't look at it that way. You know, mm-hmm. people are like, man, they got spent that much money on that. I'm like, dude, you could have that much money into a really basic drift car when you really tally it up uh, and get nickel and dime and stuff like that. Especially so, I mean, if you don't know how to build some stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, it gets expensive paying someone else to do stuff to your car. Yeah, so. Corey just said he paid twenty five hundred dollars at one point to put a four hundred dollar engine in his car. Yeah. So yeah. so I mean, <laughs> I. <laughs> It's a, I want to talk about this later about the uh, building versus bot mm-hmm. debate, but uh, that's a topic for another day. But I think that's a, that that'd be it's a really good debate, especially for people like me. I give you the cliff notes. I build cars, and I rather buy one. Truth. Okay. <laughs> well, that, that that kind of took away that debate. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we can go further into it, but, but that's the, yeah. that's the cliff note. Mm-hmm. Okay. For, for the people who still debating it before we get a chance to talk about it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, well, I think that pretty much covers uh, that topic pretty well. I mean, we got, there's just so much to cover in 
this year, and uh, I can't wait to get to all of it. But uh, again, guys, thanks for watching. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast. We will be putting out stuff every month and hopefully even sooner. And uh, I hope to see you guys uh, listening to this stuff. And uh, if you guys have any opinions, questions, comments, you know, obviously put those in the comment section. If you, uh, you disagree with everything Jelani says, like most people do, uh, just 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 go ahead and rip them apart. I'm I'm sure he uh, he he's used to it. So um, uh, be sure to do that. And uh, thanks again, guys, for watching. And uh, hopefully I see you guys on the next show. Bye.